Is former governor of Oregon, John Kitzhaber. Let's give him a round of applause and welcome him to the stage. Governor Kitzhaber. Well, thank you, DJ. Uh, I was reminded uh, when you said that uh, change happens slowly until it happens quickly. Of that wonderful line from um, Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, where someone asked Mike Campbell how he went bankrupt. And he said, well, two ways, uh, gradually, then suddenly. And I think uh, the healthcare system uh, faces that same kind of a challenge. Uh, I was uh, delighted to come out here today, and, and I'm always just struck by the powerful landscapes here when we flew in uh, to Utah. I actually uh, lived, in, uh, lived in Utah when I was quite young, uh, <clears throat> back in about 1951. I remember we lived in Logan. My dad was with the university up there for two years, and I remember, I certainly remember the Wasatch Range, and I remember Black's Canyon. And I remember we used to go camping on the east shore of Bear Lake when there was absolutely nothing there but rocks and sagebrush and magpies. And I particularly remember that my dad used to take us there with this giant umbrella, canvas umbrella tent that had an elaborate metal infrastructure that could attract lightning from four or five miles away. <clears throat> Definitely remember the lightning. So it's, it's a long, long journey from the shores of Bear Lake, Utah to the shores of the North Umpqua River in Southern Oregon, a small community called Roseburg, where I started my medical practice in 1974. And I was uh, 27 years old. I was just uh, four years out of my internship. And I can still remember how vulnerable the people were who came to see me for medical care. They were injured, they were sick, confused, frightened, and they were looking for help. And although they didn't know me, they put their trust and sometimes their lives into my hands. And I tried everything I could to help them. Used everything I had available, all the technology that was available in 1974, regardless of cost. That's what they expected, that's what my profession expected, and that's what society expects. And even then, sometimes I failed. And on those occasions, I would walk across the hall. And the hall ran in from the ambulance ramp and opened on the right through these big double doors into the ER, and on the left to a smaller room where there was a couch and some chairs. And that's where the family and friends of people who had arrived by ambulance waited for news of their loved ones. And walking across the hall at the age of 27 seemed like a ritual acknowledgment of failure. And it always seemed like a long, lonely journey to walk across 30 feet of tiled floor, carrying nothing but compassion and bad news to tell somebody that their mother or father or son who'd come to me for help was gone. Over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to practice in the emergency room and to serve in public office. And it was that experience that brought me face to face with the uh, contradiction, the conflict between my role as a physician and my role as a public official between our societal expectation that the medical system do everything possible to save someone's life regardless of cost and the reality of finite public resources. That poignant intersection between compassion and human mortality and limited resources. And I think that's the great unspoken paradox at the heart of the healthcare debate. And I think our unwillingness to explicitly take that on and have a conversation about it is one of the things that's kept us from solving one of the greatest public policy challenges of our time. I think your struggles here in Utah recently uh, represent a microcosm of the national debate, and they reflect the same false choice between cost and access that's paralyzed the US Congress. And I'm referring, of course, to the ballot measure last year that expanded Medicaid to 138% of the federal poverty level, and then the subsequent action by the Utah legislature to constrict that expansion to 100% of the federal poverty level. I think that reduced the number of people covered from like 150 down to 90, something like 90,000, something like that. But the point is that that made imminent sense from the standpoint of balancing the budget. But it will do absolutely nothing to address the fundamental structural problems in our healthcare system, and it won't do anything to reduce the total cost of care. In fact, simply expanding to 138% of the federal poverty level won't address either of those things ever, either. But I do think it's fair to say that it will, in fact, undermine the health of some of those people who did not get covered because of Senate Bill 96. So what I want you to take away from my talk today is that we don't have to settle for this. We don't have to settle by pitting vulnerable people against very real state fiscal pressures. But that requires us to recognize what this debate is and is not about. And it is not about partisan politics. This should not be cast as a partisan issue. This is an issue that affects all of us, because each and every one of us and our loved ones at some point will meet that intersection 
between compassion and more, more, mortality. So I think this is really about who we are. It's a test of who we want to be together as, as, as people. There's a third path, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. There's a third path that allows us uh, to both expand access and manage cost. And to find that path, we need to understand a deeper understanding of the national debate, but we also need to understand how our political system allows both Democrats and Republicans to avoid the consequences for their policy choices. Now, for decades, the US healthcare debate has been polarized and paralyzed by the fact that neither Democrats or Republicans assume any fundamental change in the underlying healthcare business model. We either pay for it or we don't. And that's what creates the false choice between cost and access. So Republican efforts in 2017 to repeal or defund the Affordable Care Act were efforts to stop paying for the current delivery model. The political backlash to that has been increased Democratic support for a single-payer Medicare for all approach. But a single-payer approach, if you don't change the underlying de delivery system, is just another way to pay for the status quo and will no more solve the problems that face the US healthcare system than will simply uh, defunding it. Neither of these approaches work because neither addresses the total cost of care, which is the central problem here. If you think about it, healthcare is the only economic sector that produces goods and services that none of its customers can afford. The only way that system works is because the cost of care for individuals is heavily subsidized, increasingly with public resources, either directly through public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, or indirectly through the tax exclusion for employer-sponsored coverage and the subsidies for people who are getting their care uh, through the uh, ACA exchanges. The reality is that the cost of these subsidies is exceeding the capacity of both the government and private sector employers to pay for. But interestingly enough, the debate continues to be focused on how do we pay for those subsidies rather than why healthcare costs so much uh, in the first place. So in my view, the only way forward is we've got to refocus the debate from funding or not funding the current delivery model to redefining, redesigning the underlying business model by putting downward fiscal pressure on the delivery system while maintaining access, quality, uh, and outcomes. And to do that, two things uh, are required. We need to understand the difference between healthcare and health, uh, and we need a much clearer articulation of our policy objective. What are we trying to accomplish here? And both of those have been lost, I think, in this highly partisan, contentious debate. So let's start with the difference between health and health care. I think it's fair to say that most people don't want to need medical services. No one really wants to be a patient. <clears throat> health care is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. It doesn't have any intrinsic value outside its relationship to a positive health outcome or, or relief of suffering, except as an economic commodity, which is pretty much how we address it today. The point is that the goal is not just to finance and deliver medical care, it's to keep people healthy. And we also know that among those things that have the greatest impact on people's lifetime health status, medical care is a relatively small contributor. Far more important are things like housing and nutrition, and stable families, safe communities, healthy behaviors, the other social determinants of health. But as the cost of health care continues to increase, it undermines our ability to invest in those things that actually improve the health of our society. So if our goal is health, then the policy objective needs to be a financially sustainable, we have to address the reality of, of resources here, financially su sustainable system that ensures that all Americans have timely access to affordable quality medical care and which makes effective strategic long-term investments in the social determinants of health. Now, if that's our policy objective, any system that accomplishes that has to have five key components. Universal coverage, as long as everyone doesn't have a payment source where we're always going to be cost shifting, a defined benefit, the delivery system assuming risk and accountability for quality and outcomes, in a global budget indexed to a sustainable growth of rate with some of the savings reinvested upstream in the community to address the social determinants of health. Now, a system that reflects those five goals can take many, many forms. But without addressing all five of those components, there simply is not a sustainable solution that will improve the health of our society. Now, <clears throat> to move in that direction politically, we've got to somehow cut through the complexity of the system and uh, the hyperbolic politics that surround it by asking the right questions. As Thomas Pynchon said in his novel, Gravity's Rainbow, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. Well, the healthcare system can be boiled down to five basic questions. Uh, who is covered? 
uh, or eligibility, what is covered, that is the benefit, how much is covered, cost sharing, co-payments and deductibles, et cetera, how much are we paying, that is how much are we paying doctors, physicians, and other providers, and how much is being borrowed, right? How much of this is being financed by debt? <clears throat> As the cost of healthcare begins to exceed the ability of the third party payers to, to afford it, what happens is they begin to manipulate these variables, shifting costs to individuals or to the future by putting the cost into the national debt. So these, these manipulations including reducing eligibility, which reduces, which shifts cost to individuals, reducing benefits, shifting cost to individuals, increasing co-payments and deductibles that shifts cost to individuals, reducing reimbursement to providers who at some point won't see people on Medicaid, which again shifts cost to individuals, or putting the cost into the national debt, which is uh, very serious now. Medicare and Medicaid are the major drivers of our national debt, and that simply leaves these costs for our children and grandchildren to, uh, to, to pay. The problem is that neither of these approaches, none of these manipulations address total cost of care. Right? And in fact, they actually drive up cost and undermine health because when people get sick enough, they go to the emergency room, right? Where federal law requires that they be seen and treated and then the uncompensated costs are simply shifted to private sector employers, increasing their bills, uh, uh, perpetuating, uh, perpetuating the cycle. So the point is that neither of the approaches of the Republicans or the Democrats are gonna solve this because this cost shifting reduces the political pressure for, for reform. It reduces the political pressure to change the system. So let's just take a look. Um, democratic approaches, let's just take Medicare for all. They want to basically expand eligibility to include everyone, increase benefits, reduce or eliminate cost sharing. They don't talk much about reimbursements. Let's assume it's Medicare rates. <clears throat> What's that gonna do? It's gonna dramatically increase the national debt unless taxes are significantly increased. But we also know that politically it's much easier to push the cost of healthcare into the national debt than raise the revenue necessary to pay for it. Uh, Republican approaches essentially seek to reduce the cost of health care to the federal government, or in this case to the state of Utah, which is not the same as reducing the cost of the services we're actually providing. And this primarily involves reducing eligibility, which is what Senate Bill 96 did in a sense, uh, reducing the benefit level, increasing cost sharing, and, uh, and that, of course, uh, shifts cost to individuals, right? So the question is, how do we move beyond this, this, this political gridlock to a real solution? Well, we need to start by recognizing uh, that neither approach of either party it will solve this because it doesn't address the, the fundamental issue, which is the cost of care. Instead, they shift cost to individuals, and we shift cost to our children and grandchildren to pay, and neither of those approaches should be acceptable to any of us. And the only reason they're acceptable is because the people who are making the decisions don't have to confront or be accountable for the human consequences that follow. And let me give you an example. In 1986, when I was serving as president of the Oregon State Senate, we had a $35 million hole in a Medicaid budget. So to address this, the Legislative Emergency Board, which I chaired, uh, changed income eligibility standards for the Medicaid program, right here. We changed eligibility, right? And Shazam! Our budget was balanced. I remember how easy it was. We sat in our hearing room, we looked at some numbers on a piece of paper, we took some votes and the budget was balanced. At the same time, we dropped about 5,000 people from state insurance coverage. Four months later, back in the emergency room, I started seeing some of the people who'd lost coverage because of that decision. One of them was a middle-aged man with hypertension who came into the ER with a major stroke because he'd gone without his blood pressure medication uh, for four or five months. I suddenly realized that the budget decision we made in the state capitol had very real human consequences. That the 6,000 people we dropped from coverage weren't just numbers on a piece of paper. They were real people with names and hopes and lives and dreams of their own. But as legislators, we didn't have to confront or be accountable for those human consequences. But I was not only a legislator, I was also a practicing ER doc, and there was no way I could avoid the consequences for those choices because one was lying right there, right there in front of me. So I guess what I'm saying is that the reality is that there will be people in this state who will suffer the same fate as the man who suffered the stroke in Oregon because they didn't get coverage, right? Now, I'm not picking on Utah. This happens in every state, and I've done it myself. My point is we don't have to accept that. There is a different path, and that path involves trying to take on the total cost of care. And here's one way to do it. In 2011, 
Oregon, like every other state, was struggling in the depths of the Great Recession. We had a huge budget deficit. About a third of it was in the Medicaid program. And it became clear to us that without replacement revenue, tens of thousands of Oregonians were going to lose coverage. All right? It's the same classic false choice between cost and access that you're struggling with here in Utah. So it was those circumstances that led us to seek a third path. So by front-end loading the resources that we did have into the first year of our two-year budget, we were able to maintain enrollment, but that left a $240 million hole in the second year of the budget. So our plan was to close that hole by transforming the Medicaid delivery model to get uh, better, uh, more value for each dollar spent. And this transformation was going to take place through these new organizations called coordinated care organizations. A new community-based organization with local providers, uh, local uh, citizens, a local governance structure that would take a more holistic view of health beyond just the simple clinical model. So in, in March of 2012, we passed legislation that set up the criteria for creating a coordinated care organization. And the first started popping up in, in, in later in that year. By then, it was clear that even if we could realize significant savings, the system transformation wouldn't happen fast enough to capture those savings in that budget cycle. So in May, I went to Washington, D.C., and I convinced the Obama administration not only to give us the 11 and 15 waivers we needed to use this new care model, but also a 1.9, one-time, 1.9 billion, one-time, five-year investment in exchange for a commitment to reduce the Medicaid cost trend by two percentage points by the second year of the waiver from 5.4% to 3.4% per member per month, a fixed growth rate, with no reduction in enrollment or benefits, and meeting rigorous metrics around access, quality, and outcomes. So the 3.4% per member per month growth rate was, in, in essence, a total cost of care benchmark, growth benchmark for the Medicaid program, which other states are beginning to explore, like Massachusetts. So in the first year of the waiver, we added 385,000 more people under the ACA Medicaid expansion. All the CCOs met the quality and outcome metrics. The state operated within the 3.4% growth cap, paid back the $1.9 billion federal investment, and realized a $1 billion uh, uh, all funds cumulative savings. So it was a really good story. It was a story made possible by putting downward fiscal pressure on the delivery system through a global budget that grew at a fixed rate uh, while meeting vigorous metrics around quality, outcome, and, and patient satisfaction. Now we're poised to take <clears throat> this to the next level, to become more granular in our approach to total cost of care. Over the past couple of years, we begin to notice regional variations in that PMPM -PM growth rate, from about 2% up to over 6%. Oregon, like Utah, has an all-claims, all-payers database, and we're also uh, participate in the Network for Regional Healthcare Improvement, which, as you know, is a national organization of local groups committed to improving healthcare by analyzing data uh, around quality, uh, price, utilization across these six regional uh, commercial markets. The Oregon specific data comes from 143 primary care clinics, each of which has at least 600 commercial members scattered around the state. And as you can see, there is a dramatic variation in cost and quality across those clinics. The same thing that we're seeing in our coordinated care organizations. So early analysis suggests that if we could move um, all the clinics just to the average of the top 25 clinics in terms of, of quality uh, and cost, we would see an 11% reduction in the total cost of care, about $2 billion a year across all payers. The potential here is enormous, and we don't need to reduce the total cost of care 11% to actually get all our CCOs back down to the 3.4% growth rate. So the point is that we now have the data to identify these variations in price, in utilization, in quality, down to the individual practitioner, the clinic, the hospital, and the coordinated care organization. Because we've already established a total cost of care benchmark for Medicaid at 3.4%, we're now in the process of putting together a very broad coalition of stakeholders to see if we can figure out how to use this data to drive the total cost of care and the CCOs back down to 3.4% and then apply those lessons to the commercial market uh, and to Medicare uh, Advantage. This is going to require leadership. It's going to require political leadership and leadership from the health sector, and engagement and leadership from the business community and from consumer uh, advocacy groups. But the point is that with the data we now have, and which Utah could gain access to, 
reducing the total cost of care while expanding access and maintaining quality and outcomes is no longer obstructed by a technical barrier. It's now a matter of will and trust <clears throat> and compassion. You know, this doesn't have to be a, a bitter and partisan debate. This is a debate that affects all of us, as I mentioned earlier. It is not a partisan issue, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an intimately human issue. And it's one that we have the capacity to address. Uh, I think my time's running out here. I just want to leave you with uh, one observation. You know, during the, the, the years I practiced in the emergency room, I can't remember a single instant, instance when I checked someone's party registration before I treated them, or wondered whether Democrats bleed different than Republicans, or wondered whether cardiovascular disease or cancer respects partisanship or political ideology. It seems to me in this divided nation of ours, certainly my state's divided, and I think Utah might be to some extent, the one thing that we indisputably hold in common, and that should draw us together, is our shared mortality. All of us share the same brief moment of life, and in the words of Robert Kennedy, seek nothing but the opportunity to live out our lives and purpose and happiness, achieving such satisfaction and fulfillment we can. This is not an insoluble problem. It is a choice. It's a choice uh, to put understanding before reaction, uh, to put cooperation uh, before conflict, and to put reconciliation before recrimination. And if we're willing to remember that, if we're willing to remember that, and remember that this is about each and every one of us, I don't think there's any chance that we'll fail in making the system work. Thank you. Well, thank you, Governor. I appreciate it. I always, uh, I always enjoy hearing you talk, and I always feel let down that I haven't done enough to change the world in between the times we see each other. Uh, there's a lot in there. I, I want to, I guess I'm curious about a lot of things. Um, I, I want to ask, and I'll leave as a placeholder because I don't think we'll have time, about what you think ought to go in to define benefit. Um, I may come back to that, but I want to ask first about role of leadership in getting this, this, this momentum. Some of that's political leadership, some of that's industry leadership. Um, it seems like you almost cannot move this ball forward without political will, and that if the political leadership starts, the industry might come kicking and screaming. They might not come at all, but that the industry probably can't lead the politicians on this one. Would you say that's? Yeah, I, I do think you need, um, <clears throat> you need political leadership, and that political leadership needs to be able to rise above sort of party definitions and recognize that there's two parts of this. One is cost. This is a system that we can't afford. We had a conversation last night about some of these specialty drugs that cost $2 million a pop. These are increasingly paid for with public resources. And the issue we don't really want to come to terms with is how much care should one individual have for their own personal health care paid for with public resources when that cost is reducing our ability to invest in schools, in early childhood learning, in housing, et cetera, right? I mean, it, it, we just have to come to terms with this. And the other piece of it is that, you know, I don't personally believe that healthcare is a human right, but I do believe everyone should have an equal, op equal opportunity to be healthy, which means that you have a right to some defined level of effective healthcare, but also to a job and a house and a stable family, if health is our objective. So you need to unbundle this because we get into this situation where it literally is cost versus access and if you don't like access, you've got a bad, you know, you're bad, and it, it, it's just, uh, it, it, and that takes the political leadership. But it also takes leadership in, 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 in the health sector to step up and acknowledge that the system's out of control, which I think we, we've seen industry leaders acknowledging and saying, we have to go beyond acknowledging that this is a problem. We need to figure out what the solution is. Do you think, I mean, certainly in Medicare and Medicaid, this is not an either or question, but it's an and. Uh, but the political possibilities at the federal level versus the political possibilities at the state level. Um, what do you think? Do you think that we should be waiting for a comprehensive fix to come out of Washington, D.C., or do you think that states should be moving more quickly and more independently? I don't, I don't think a comprehensive fix will come out of D.C. I think it will come from the state and regional level. We've been having conversations along the West Coast of trying to take the model that we've developed and provide some modification in California and Washington. 
right? So I think, I think, I think the innovation is gonna come from the state level. But I also think that we need to be willing to have the courage to take on the issues at the state legislative level that the United States Congress is not willing to take. You know, the, repeating the ACA doesn't solve the health care problem, saves a lot of money. Going to a single, pay, Medicare for all is not going to solve the problem either, but the 2020 election cycle is being set up to con perpetuate that same false choice. And if the Democrats get elected on Medicare for all, they will catch the bus in the same way that the Republicans did in 2017 and won't be able to accomplish anything. We just can't afford to continue this. So I think the leadership uh, needs to come from, from the states. Utah's a great place. I, I overlapped eight years with uh, Mike Levitt. Uh, we did a lot of stuff together. I think he uh, is a, a, a very powerful leader. I think Governor Herbert, who we just slightly over, over, overlapped with, has, a, has tried. I think it was called Healthy Utah. Took, took an attempt at this. There are ways to do this, but it does require political leadership and requires the citizens of the state to support that leadership in asking and answering uh, difficult questions. So this defined benefit pack, well, I want to ask about the prioritized list. We'll see if I get to the defined benefit or not. Uh, so this prioritized list that Oregon implemented in 1990 when it first, or thereabouts, when 94. the Oregon Health Plan was, was first created uh, in 94, uh, that is, tell us about that, and, and I, I want to tease that because I think there's some potential utility here in Utah. So what is it and, and what has it accomplished for Oregon? So in, in the late, late 80s, what Oregon was doing is exactly what Utah was doing. We were basically dealing with uh, cost and increased cost in the Medicaid program by dropping people from coverage, right? So what we did is we established eligibility 100% of the federal poverty level, including the non-categorical eligibles, right? So anyone with an income up to 100% was eligible, which required a federal waiver. So this was like the first Medicaid expansion 20 years before the ACA. Um, and then we basically said, um, we're gonna prioritize medical services based on their clinical effectiveness and social values. That will be given to an independent actuary that will determine the cost of providing each element. And that gives back to the legislature. So if you have a revenue shortfall, you can no longer throw people under the bus. You can no longer arbitrarily cut provider reimbursement rates because that's been established uh, uh, separately. You have to look at actually the benefit package. So it forced legislators to be accountable for not just what they funded, but also for what they chose not to fund. Uh, and it connected uh, the benefit to the dollars that we were willing to spend. It was, it was very real in that sense, right? And we've been using that priority list for 30 years. No one has ever accused us of having a skinny Medicaid benefit package. It's transparent, it's open, there's a public process involved. So it's a good way to essentially develop the, the, the rationale for a capitation rate, right? I mean, it doesn't say providers can't provide more or less, but their capitation rate is built on the expectation that those services are gonna be, gonna be provided. So I think there's a lot of utility to it. It wasn't a cost control, but a cost containment mechanism. We didn't get to that until we got to the global budget and the, and the index to uh, growth rate. So to, is, it, is it an accurate oversimplification to say that largely under that model in the 90s and up until the ACA that uh, Oregon Medicaid stopped cutting, when they got into a fiscal pinch, they stopped cutting people and started cutting benefits. All right. Were those benefits that were cut efficacious or were they No, if you look at, the, look at the list, there are things like, uh, you know, uh, conditions for which uh, medical treatment didn't change the outcome. Um, we did have one very high profile case. It's the only high profile case. It was a very tragic case. A young woman who had cystic fibrosis needed a heart, liver, and lung transplant, which was totally experimental. No evidence that it worked and the state didn't provide it. Uh, she got it. Someone got it. It didn't work, right? But it gave it, it gives you a, it, it, it's, it's interesting if you have a transparent process and people, people understand limits. They have to balance their household checkbooks. When you, you know, when you uh, have three kids and don't have enough money, you don't stop giving health care to two of them and just take care of one of them, right? So it's, it's common sense. And it has been far less controversial in practice than it was when we were trying to get the waivers to get it done. What final thoughts, counsel, advice would you give to this room? I think uh, we attract audiences of goodwill, people who want to want to move the system forward and want to understand how to work strategically, collaboratively across these silos, what counsel would you give them to, in, in this time of transition in Utah Medicaid? I, I, think, I think you should recognize that you've, you've made a, a huge step forward in terms of coverage. You've gone to, you've added another 90,000 people or whatever it is. You've gone to 100%, uh, that, and you should get kudos for that. Uh, you still have a lot of people who don't have coverage. Uh, and I think the thing to remember is you can actually, ex if, if the only reason you can't expand that is the cost, 
that should be an opening and an obvious uh, opportunity to begin to address the total cost of care so that you can expand those people and deal with the very real fiscal constraints that uh, state budgets are under in uh, 2019. Let me ask this final question, which is uh, uh, there's an election next year. There are 19 Democratic candidates. Apparently, everybody who's ever been elected is running for president. Do you want to run for president? Absolutely not. All right. <laughs> Governor John Kitzhaber, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause.